So we have um, we have good time now for for questions. I'll close uh, uh, at two, so we've got uh, over half an hour. Uh, you want to lead off? And just just uh, well, we know who he is, but just introduce yourself, and then we can get it for the the cameras as well. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Andy Norton, Director of Research ODI. Thanks very much to all of the panel. Some great presentations. Um, Karen and Alberto, your main framework paper basically has a hypothesis that you would get better public policy for competitiveness if you take account of climate change and these other impacts. And I think you pick out two areas. One is investment climate reform, the other is industrial policy, where you get that better policy. But most of the examples you, s you found in the field seem to be more like autonomous adaptation by businesses rather than policy driven. So two questions, did you find any movement in policy? Was there anything on the scorecard in the three countries in a pu public policy sense that reflected your hypothesis or any movement in that direction? And the second question is, how important after having you know, done the country work do you think the public policy piece is? Do you think it's important or do you think it's all about actually autonomous adaptation in the private sector? That's all. Let me uh, just a couple of substantive points. Let me get that done, and I'll come. I'll come back to you. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's a great question. Um, I think we we haven't got on to thinking in detail about the policy recommendations, and that is a, that is the next step really in this process. I think we did certainly hear when you ask, is there movement, or, or is that the way it's being considered in country? I would say in some quarters it was, and we certainly got uh, almost lobbied by certain people that we interviewed to say, yes, we love the way you're thinking about this and asking these questions. That's not the way it's seen here, though. Could you please put these points to the ministry, whichever one it was, you know, to try and get them to notice these issues and see the synergies? So I think there is recognition. I think the tourism sector was the one where that really came across. The tourism sector is thinking about these issues a lot. They are a potential force for good, although there are some you know, trade-offs there too, but generally speaking, and they feel that they are not often well represented by government and government is not taking into account the potential economic contribution tourism can make and uh, help to build a case for protecting the forest, whatever it is, So, uh, and you know, better resource management. So that's quite a wide range of issues that the tourism sector is relevant to and is not being fully adopted or, or understood by government. So I think there is a lot more to be done, and we hope that this you know, will help to raise awareness of these kinds of other drivers and incentives and economic benefits that can be associated with thinking about these issues together. Um, in terms of industrial policy, I think, and investment climate reform, I think that what it can help to do is identify perhaps certain areas where you could prioritise reforms particular investment climate reforms that could unlock particular opportunities in a, in a quite a selective way, I guess. So it is a little bit moving towards the proactive industrial policy. I wouldn't normally recommend traditional industrial policy, but I think there is a case for thinking about how to progress a particular sector or product or value or supply chain and that these are the things that need to be unlocked to achieve that and doing that in quite a strategic way. Didn't see much of that kind of thing going on, but I think the potential is there to do that in a more intelligent way. I've got two questions here. Betty, I'm going to come back to you after these two questions just to ask about the situation in, in Kenya with, in particular, the, uh, the public policy relating to, to energy and power, which is striking and, and significant. Okay, I got it. Um, Alex McGilvery from Climate Business. So it's really interesting. Um, and just picking up on Karen's point, I think, about this question about our countries really using their endowments and then sort of mm. trying to tie that into Fraser's point about thinking outside traditional sectors. So um, last year I was talking to, um, I think, Betty, your, your equivalent organization in Colombia, the, the, the Employers Federation there, about why it is that Colombia has 80% hydroelectricity, so it's a world leader in hydroelectricity, but is not really very capable of dealing with mudslides and all sorts of other effects that it gets from increased rainfall, and which, which companies that have been in the hydro sector are the ones that are dealing with mudslides. And, and the people were very puzzled, though. They said, well, we don't, have a, we don't have a sector on that. 
And so the, the question really, and it could go to Betty as well, is are you seeing companies redefine themselves into new sectors? And how, do, how are you as a business association encouraging learning between organisations that see these opportunities but get pigeonholed by policymakers into an old sector when really uh -huh. their growth potential is in a new sector that hasn't uh -huh. even got a name yet? Interesting. Um, do, do you mind if I just deal with that one and I'll come to you because that is an opportunity for Betty to come in. It also is interesting, I noticed from the way you presented um, on more than one occasion, waste into energy, uh, waste in another category, recycling. And now, of course, we're moving into a phase where, where we're starting to mine landfill sites. We're starting to uh, recover raw materials so that the waste industry is becoming a raw material industry. And you know, this, this is a classic instance of a transformation underway without adequate labels yet. Yes. Right? Um, Betty, do you feel able to come in on Alex's question about defining a sector and redefining a sector, but also maybe pick up my point about the value of public policy um, in Kenya in order to uh, to deal partly with, with Andy's point about the <coughs> relationship between what business is doing in an adaptive sense and what government's encouraging them to do through good public policy. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Um, let me take up the policy question first, as well as then, then the discussion of what business is doing to respond. And in the context of um, <coughs> in the context of Kenya, both both business and government have worked hand in hand to develop the to develop the policy. Uh, when I look back at our own work, for instance, the focus on energy efficiency in industrial production uh, started. Uh, out of an interest of business, but that was soon taken up uh, and made and, 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 and adopted into government policy. Therefore, the energy policy and the energy ministry for the longest time has had a focus on energy efficiency and, of course, renewable uh, energy development. And that has then spanned, uh, uh, spawned some more business responses to the point where you have quite a large number of uh, you know, private suppliers uh, or interested suppliers in uh, feeding into the system and feeding into the grid. And therefore, the feed-in tariff uh, policy has also, sorry, um, has also been quite helpful in encouraging investment in small small projects, small hydro projects, and such another renewable energy project. So the interest of business and, uh, and the facilitation of government policy has created an environment where we have quite a bit uh, of uh, solutions coming coming on stream. Uh, we manage uh, the technical assistance work for uh, for a grant. I mean, for a, for a line of credit that's been made available by AFD for banks to invest in renewable energy and energy efficiently. About a 39, uh, 39, 000, uh, 39 million uh, US um, dollars. We have projects on stream uh, that would require six times more than the available credit line. So there's a lot of interest and a lot of investment that uh, would, it's now chasing obviously looking for the investment in it. So we think that that sort of public policy has <coughs> created uh, great interest from, uh, for, 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 from business. And, and the Kenya government in this case, I think comes up for particular commendations for its leadership in this regard, both uh, and 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 uh, the feed-in tariff, by the way, Alberto was um, was reviewed recently to something that um, businesses would probably consider a lot more rewarding than what was in the books, uh, what there was in the books before. Now, in the context and about whether we are all getting specific uh, businesses, my view is that in the context of Kenya, we don't really have extreme. I mean, we don't sort of have extreme whether weather conditions. So what we've seen is uh, businesses or responses and uh, trading partners that have solutions in energy efficiency, in uh, renewable energy technologies, in um, agricultural, you know, better agricultural practice and water management practices. Uh, we've seen that a lot. I haven't sort of seen the ones that are dealing with mudslides as much because I think we don't have such, a, I mean, so, so, such an extreme case. But the whole point is that there is a lot of business interest, and that has been encouraging both for us and for government. Thank you, Betty. Now I'll take one more here, and there's another one and a couple more over here. So let's just get this. Question. 
Good afternoon. My name is Nick Hughes. I'm from uh, Imperial College here in London. Um, thanks again to all the panel for their great contributions. My question is about um, energy technologies and costs and the resulting prices that then feed into consumers and, and industry. And um, um, Alberto was making the point that um, currently and indeed probably for, for, for a long time the, um, the upfront cost of investing in fossil fuel generators are lower than uh, investing in low carbon um, generation technologies. Um, but I'm struck that there's, there's also this uh, kind of trade-off which is not always reflected between upfront costs and ongoing operational costs. And of course for renewable technologies, the, um, the operational costs are significantly less, uh, proportionally less of the total overall cost. And of course they're less um, vulnerable to the risk of um, uh, fluctuating fossil fuel prices, which um, over the course of their lifetime could be, there could be a strong argument that that yields um, a, a significant benefit to to the people who own the, the generators and to and to wider economic actors who consume that energy and have a more stable price to think about. Um, so I wondered if there's been any any sense in which that argument of, of the kind of the long term potential long term stability of a lower carbon mix could be um, a benefit in terms of reducing risks to price volatility in, in these kind of um, examples? Crucial question, Nick, and I'm if you don't mind, I was going to take this because um, I certainly have views on this, which I will not be able to resist <laughs> providing you, but we might all have a, view, have a go at that because it's critical to understanding the attractiveness of the thesis to a, a, a growing economy is clearly going to have to worry about cost, but, but, but sometimes doesn't have the luxury of the long term when there are really short-term demands. Um, so three major, three issues uh, with that. Some organizations recognize that, uh, and I'm looking at it from the private sector perspective here, um, that there are lower costs but uh, in the long term. But the main issue, uh, number one issue is the lack of financing. They just can't get the capital necessary required to invest in the higher upfront costs. So that's been the number one issue that we've been told is, no, we can't get access to capital to invest in like solar or this or that. It's just cheaper to get a generator. It's much cheaper, it's like half or a third of the price, and we can't secure a loan to, to get solar tech or uh, other things like that. So that's the first one. Um, second thing is an issue of information. There's <coughs> perhaps information on long-term savings just isn't available. And so there a lot of companies don't know that they could be saving money by investing in solar and renewables. And, um, well, actually, those are the two main ones. Mm -hmm. It's where they know it, they don't have the money, and if they don't know it, it's because it hasn't been divulged by other companies that uh, they are saving. In Kenya, though, they've CAM um, has the Kenya Association of Manufacturers has started a, an advertising campaign to show the savings that companies have had, uh, member companies. But still, you've still got the issue of upfront costs and uh, lack of capital for that. Good. Yeah. Has a nuance on this. Keep going. Uh, just to add a couple of points to that, I think another big issue is uncertainty about both the price of energy, different forms of energy, what kind of tariffs you might get, feed-in tariffs, whatever, that makes it very difficult to take some of these decisions. Um, and uncertainty about future government policy and how that will evolve. Um, and, uh, um, and just another point I want to make is that none of these countries have fossil fuel subsidies because they're low-income countries, they can't really afford it. But you can, if you think through the logic of what we've been doing, fossil fuel subsidies would make a huge um, impact on the incentives and um, uh, decision-making that would happen and would definitely result in less competitive outcomes in the longer term because they're not sustainable after a while anyway. So that uh, none of these countries have that as an issue, but when you compare it with other countries who have big fossil fuel subsidies, that will have a really detrimental impact on competitiveness going forward, countries like Egypt, for example, which and who can't afford to maintain those fossil fuel subsidies as well. Fraser. Uh, yeah, just very briefly, we did a, a piece of work for a government which um, looked at what we call the full cost of uh, different energy sources. And we took the, the actual cost today and then we priced in some of these factors. So the volatility risk, we actually had very good tools from hedging and different financial markets to actually put a price on that. Uh, and then we tried to put price on some of those other externalities. Carbon's an obvious one, but also water, which is for some, uh, particularly renewable technologies, unfortunately there's a... Um, embedded subsidy there in the cost of water. Um, some of them are quite water intensive. Um, and so we did that and actually had a sort of a fact-based way of saying, 
if you believe these kind of externalities and these pricings is the kind of decision you'd make on your power mix. So, briefly, first of all, there are examples, particularly for the very poor, where diesel is an expensive option as compared to solar. Mm. Okay? If you really, really have no access, then a diesel generator is a positive luxury that you can't afford, but a solar lantern is something that you can. Right? Secondly is that uh, the access to capital point I completely agree with, but it also shows you how to get over that problem. It is a capital deployment, long-term finance issue, not a technology issue. Third thing is that there are um, real opportunities to build very different systems from scratch um, with a good public policy framework in place. And, and Kenya is one of those places that at least has the potential for doing that because they have a plan, a plan that's worked on for many years and it's not implemented as yet, but it's got good potential to be converted into a very different kind of energy system where mm. the price for fossil fuel importation um, is uh, progressively removed from from the macro economy of, of the nation, which is a very significant achievement. Um, uh, and final point is that almost in every circumstance where um, there is a contest between uh, imported fossil fuels um, and almost any of the renewable energy options, the, uh, a system that is genuinely distributed in power will win, provided you can get over the financing hurdle. Right? Because it's, mm. just, it's just straightforward that you, you have the capacity, you have more control over your own inputs, you have less long-term operating costs, um, and you have the ability to usually to take either a waste product that has been value-less or something that has no cost, sunlight, wind, in order to run your system. Right. So if you have a chance to design it from scratch, if, then you have a huge advantage. That's, yeah. I was just going to say, but uh, I was just gonna, in terms of financing, what we've seen there is just not to pull your hopes on mechanisms like CDM or other things like that, which tend to actually be too long and bureaucratic for a lot of companies that were hoping to access them, but just couldn't for various reasons. So it turned out to um, not be able to access th that kind of finance for uh, for the investment. So there needs to be a different, ki simpler kind of mechanism, which is not as cumbersome as the CDM mechanism to help them access finance if we want to look at it from an external point of view if not then we just have to rely on private sector institutions like in Nepal where mm -hmm. there's the renewable energy development bank which is was set up specifically for the idea privately set up for the idea of providing investments for these kind of processes but it's a good example that there was we still seem to need intermediary organizations to structure and direct but we did also learn even out of the disappointment of the carbon market that one you can measure performance against a standard, in this case carbon reduction, and two, you can mobilise capital with an incentive, it's just that that incentive was for units of carbon, not for renewable energy. So it never really worked, it was never going to be able to work to, to transform an energy system in an emerging economy, never. But we've learned from it and you now can attach it to payment for performance, it could be attached to a public fund, it could be a metric for delivery of monies out of a, uh, out of a development bank. It's, um, it, you know, it, the carbon market has taught us many things, including what doesn't work. <laughs> yes, the two over there. Hello, it's Pippa Palmer from SolarAid. And as you <laughs> might expect, I'm going to say, and I just heard you mention the word solar lantern. Um, one, of, one of the things you, you said earlier on is, is that um, off-grid, it's still slightly easier to invest in fossil fuels. And the grid will never keep up with demand, particularly with the, with the issue of remoteness. And one of the things that I'm mm. wondering is when you talk about off-grid, you're talking mini-grids, you're talking about sort of standalone mini-grid type systems. How much does PICO feature for you? Because it's, it's just going at such a pace where the solar lanterns now will last five years and they cost $10. Yeah. Um, solar laptops coming up, solar TVs, sol solar yeah. water purifiers. I could go on for a week, yeah. but but this is going to be, is this going to be a part of the picture? Well, and how do we make that be? Because it's huge. And it's, it's not huge. just for the very small, I should have mentioned in, in addition, um, <sighs> solar PV is a very good substitute for diesel at mine mouth. Yes, right? yes. In remote areas, and, it, and, it, and it's cost effective today if you have unreliable power. Mm. Yes. So, um, you know, how to factor in unreliability, you know, this, this, most businesses care very deeply about reliability. 
Yeah, it's not sure. the case that diesel is the, is the answer to that. So um, I don't know whether you've got so perspectives on the panel about this point. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. I, was, I was going to say, we, I've, I've just this weekend been working on a study um, w w with UNEP figures to say if you took the kerosene lamp out of 37 countries in Africa and replaced it with small solar, you would reduce £10.5 billion pounds of spend, household spend. Households are spending 25%. Yeah. I'm interested to hear businesses doing the same. Yeah. And could Pico Solar make that difference now rather than wait? Yeah. That's, that's my burning question. That's also a factor in, in Nick's question. Absolutely. About what, you, what can you do with the saved revenues over time if you're managing an economy over yes. decades rather than tomorrow's mm -hmm. you know, financial crisis? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, do you want to store that for a minute? Because it's a good continuing conversation, and I want to get this gentleman directly behind you and get his question in. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Afis Amadou. I'm um, originally from Benin, but I came from uh, Washington, D.C. So I think this meeting, I have a background in economics and uh, statistical analysis, but I have no, no previous experience in climate change, and I'm trying to learn about this subject because it's a new subject, and uh, my strategy is to attend a meeting like this and forums <laughs> around the world. That's the reason why I came over here today. Um, my first question is, is this uh, presentation going to be f sometimes available online? Yeah. It's all online, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, my next question will be, um, I'm going to focus on low-income countries with uh, the challenges that they're facing in terms of uh, adaptation and uh, mitigation of uh, the climate change effect. And uh, the, presen the presenter pr the dimensions two of them, two of the challenges, the national resource scarcity and um, the investment um, incentives. When we talk about the national resource scarcity, the, um, the international community is calling the low-income countries to, to stop exploiting the forest, for example, because most of the low-income countries' economy is based on exploitation of the forest. And the international community is calling them to conserve the forest. And to implement this means that there will be a, a change in uh, the economical activities because some of, some of the household in African countries or low-income countries get their resources their from forest exploitation. As a researcher, how do you foresee the paradigm change how do you force, how do you think household can adapt to this new pattern yep. in terms of their economical activities? Yep. And my second question is uh, in, uh, about the incentive for investment. The international community is calling for the only the only way for low income country right now to to attract investment is uh, about, the, I mean, according to the international community, is the, the private and public partnership. Um, personally, I don't think if, I don't think that can work. But I just wanna, I just wanna ask you as a researcher, I just wanna ask your opinion, what do you think about this call for public and private, I mean, we call it PPP. Yeah. What do you think? So is the question more, where's the investment going to come from? Exactly. That transformation? Okay, so exactly. It. Brilliant. Thank you very much. All right. So um, do you want to do with uh, the, the, the forest, the conflict between exploitation and management and value creation through sustainable management of forest? And then maybe perhaps we can have a, have a go at the investment. Sure. Okay. okay. Um, so on the forest, actually, of all the sectors, I was most pessimistic about forest because although um, there are some alternative livelihood options they seem that would be more sustainable they seem to be so much less lucrative than the short run exploitation 
as to be almost impossible to achieve. And we, we heard these success stories in Nepal about community-led forest programs um, were held up as, as a big success. Communities have been managing areas of forest and because they have an incentive to maintain that forest and the value of it uh, for the long term, because they're going to de be dependent on it, they have controlled exploitation themselves as a community and are now managing it in a sustainable way. That was great until we learned that that was only really true in the mid, the fairly high areas of forest. In the low areas of forest, where the, there are roads that lead to the border, <laughs> they still tried to set up community groups and it completely failed because they can easily chop down the trees and export them to the border and make a lot of money. And so the incentives were not strong enough to maintain the, um, the sort of protection of the forest. So the economics are not great in the forest. Um, things like red maybe mm. could help if it ever got going one day. One day. <laughs> um, but it would have to be quite generous and it would have to be quite clever in the way that it did that in order to really create alternative livelihoods that really pay. We did come across some like non-timber forest products as a way to make alternative livelihoods and um, there's very specific niche sectors which are being developed in some countries which are quite exciting but pretty localised and mm. small scale. It's hard to see that scaling up to the degree to actually save forest in, in it. Ecotourism similarly, very small scale. Going and there's co-production too. I mean, there are examples of shade, shade coffee and cocoa being effectively uh, managed where the, 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 the cover, uh, the diversity, that the particular values mm. associated with forest cover are maintained whilst a valuable commodity crop is produced, whether it's for an internal market or, or for export. Uh, th th there are examples of that, if we're not devoid of them. Um, it's also the issue of um, what kind of systems you use to, um, to produce in forests. Um, it was estimated in Nepal that if they started <laughs> using scientific forest management principles uh, rigorously applied, they could actually increase logging output by what was that? about a hundredfold, but while still maintaining sustainability. Right now, it's much lower levels of logging, but high levels. Uh, but it's actually much more damaging the, the way they're doing it. So, so they could actually maintain mm. logging output, but do so in a su sustainable manner. And the other issue is that of monitoring. Even if they could get red mechanisms and things going on, with a, if they don't have the technical capacity to monitor and evaluate what's actually going on on the ground, uh, it's very difficult to manage these systems anyway. So yeah, you can't you literally yeah. capture the value if you can't monitor it. And before I get you in, mm. I want to just check with Betty. If you've got Betty, would you like to come in before we end on any of these matters? Uh, the Pico Solar point in Kenya or, or, or investment, where's the money going to come from to expand your economy in a more green orientation? <coughs> I think once, thanks, I think once a country decides or once a business decides that that is the path it is going to take, there are resources. I mean, it will obviously have to put in the resources. Um, <coughs> Western, <coughs> so excuse me, Western donors who support uh, developments in countries such as ours or Nepal have uh, have also sent signals that they'd like to support green, 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 green growth. So that is one source yeah. of, of of resources. But in the banks, we are finding that banks are also uh, using efficiencies and uh, and such uh, criteria for for judgment on grants and loans that you will make to, to different investors. So I, I think once the signal is sent, sent, sent to society, which it, which it has been, we are increasingly finding resources also chasing investments yeah. uh, in, this, in, 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 in this regard, yeah. Fraser. Uh, so on the, the capital question, it's a fundamental one. Um, we estimated in our work that roughly um, $3.8 trillion was needed per year in capital investment to go after both the, the climate change agenda and the resource agenda um, simultaneously. Mm. So huge chunk of change. And I'm sure James is better versed than he can tell you about the, the broader international financing vehicles, et cetera, that are there, which are important. But I think the, the overlooked factor, it's about how do we mobilize the private sector? Um, and particularly at the moment, the amount of capital that's on balance sheets for the moment, if you just take Europe, for example, there's 700 million euros of excess capital yeah. on balance sheets because no one's got the certainty yeah. to invest. What a huge opportunity to try to mobilise some of this capital in the areas that's most needed. 
And we, we have examples of this. Um, I mentioned earlier about the food waste in, yeah. in Mexico and, and Walmart there did this end-to-end -end investment which just transformed the supply chain in Mexico. And they did that through an effective public-private partnership which tried to understand what are the specific barriers that prevent private sector investment in that area today. What does the government need to do? And then how do they sort of pave the way that it makes for a profitable investment for the, the private sector? And I think this kind of thinking of really understanding where are the big productivity opportunities and what are the barriers holding back private sector investment, I think this is the area that hasn't got enough attention today. Mm. So I think your question opens up a brilliant space for, for this whole program. Uh, I would have said things, just to endorse a couple of things I'd already. One, uh, that there is significant amounts of public money available that's got a tag on them. We would like this money to be used in such a way uh, that delivers these extra benefits. Okay. So and that's true of, of what might, have be, might be called donor money, but it's also to money that's in development banks has now got some standards attached to it. Uh, the second thing is that there is risk capital available in emerging economies, and it's homegrown. Uh, the money that's available in the uh, pension funds of Africa are significant. And if you look at the allocations they're making for investment, they have much higher elements to private equity or risk capital than most of their uh, uh, so-called developed country counterparts. So if you look at the pension uh, funds, from uh, public employees funds, particularly in Southern Africa and East Africa, but also in West Africa, uh, they are allocating some, some, some of them up to 20, 25 percent into, into growth businesses. Right? So there is domestic capital that can absorb risk. Because without risk capital, no development. Whoever absorbs it, whether it's a small entrepreneur uh, investing last year's uh, uh, harvest surplus or, or a professional investor uh, working out of a capital city, without risk capital, no development. Right? And then there's the corporate balance sheets, which are strong right now, including in those companies that have long supply chains or who are looking to find resources from the emerging economies, including uh, the, 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 the one you were thinking of and the others like them, right? where, where there is a supply chain that can be connected to expenditure that can be made from a balance sheet in that supply chain, and that is increasingly happening. But my so parting shot would be, there's also a huge appetite for investment in emerging economies mm -hmm. in the great capital markets like London. And, uh, but they are looking for some other reasons, mm -hmm. or rather to take away some of the reasons not to invest, and some of that is to do with public policy regimes and intermediaries that they can trust to work with um, in these economies and without that, that that's a partnership too it may not be single project partnership but it's a relationship that needs to be put in place yeah. and maybe I should leave it to the to the, you know, the, the homegrown research team to, to, to conclude um, uh, and we haven't got time for more questions of online as it were but maybe we can carry on the conversation after we've broken up so I don't know whether you want to finish off Karen or Antonio or both yeah. Um, okay, I just wanted to go back to the question somebody asked about are companies redefining themselves because I think some of them really are and in fact apart from the forestry sector which was depressing, all the others, I came away quite optimistic actually that there's a lot going on. Um, companies that are, are redefining themselves include the sugar company that is burning bagasse and is now beginning, it can even make more money by selling that to the grid than it can by making sugar and so now it wants to invest <laughs> more in generation uh, capacity. So that's an interesting one. Uh, another one was that's uh, a, a flower producer that set up a water storage tank that collects it off the roofs of the um, greenhouses and collects it in storage tanks and is now selling that to the villagers in, a, in addition to um, using it for their own production. So there's really interesting examples going on of, of, uh, of all sorts of innovative things that are contributing more widely to the community as well as to the businesses themselves. We came across companies that are growing forest in order to get access to, to wood, burning tyres and doing waste to energy, um, setting up micro hydro, training farmers on conservation agriculture. Lots and lots and lots is going on and it's really 
really quite exciting to hear about it. And I think there's, it seemed to me there's more going on in these countries because of the high energy costs, etc., than there are perhaps even in, in richer countries which don't have these kinds of problems. And this stands them in good stead in the future in terms of competitiveness and growth and trade. So I think mm. it's really quite a good news story. And so I was quite positive about it. So thank Excellent. You. Well, I'm going to bring it to conclusion. There's always a connection between constraint and creativity. So you'll find lots of good ideas uh, emerging from uh, uh, the low-income countries. And you can also uh, be sure that the ODI will properly test all of these theories and propositions. There'll be no rose-tinted spectacles about low-carbon growth, so um, you can depend upon that. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, for attending here physically and online. Thank you very much, Betty, for joining us uh, from Kenya. Technology worked, which is always thank a good you. thing. Uh, and thank you for all your assistance, mm -hmm. and um, let's keep the conversation going. Well done.